a motion to reconvene open public session. We need a motion. So moved. Is there a second? Second. So it was moved by Claire. Second by Catherine. Thank you. All, well, let's do the roll call. Ms. Versa? Ms. Berkowitz? Yes. Ms. Bull? Yes. Ms. Simarusti? Yes. Mr. Ross? Yes. Ms. Sherber? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. Mr. Wharton? Yes. We need a motion to approve the June 2nd regular and executive session minutes. So, so moved. moved. Second. Is there any discussion on those minutes? Linda. Ms. Berkowitz? Yes. Ms. Bull? Yes. Ms. Simarusti? Yes. Mr. Ross? Yes. Ms. Sherber? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. Mr. Wharton? Abstain. Linda, were there any communications? I don't recall. Uh, well, there may have been a smattering of emails, not that much. Um, Again, I want to uh, remind the board members of the annual uh, New Jersey School Boards Association workshop from October 28th to 30th in Atlantic City. If anyone's interested in attending, please let my office know. And also, the deadline for school board candidates for the November election will be July 28th. Pe uh, petitions are available in the business office of the school district and at the county clerk's office. Thank you, Linda. Tim? We'll start with your last student update. <laughs> um, finals will begin in the high school tomorrow and are ending Friday the 20th. Um, the graduation ceremony is scheduled for Monday the 23rd at 6 p.m. Um, also, our new students of the year have been announced and they are Jesenia Garcia and Jonathan Harley, both seniors. And this week, Student Congress is organizing International Week, which is basically a week to celebrate the diversity within our school. And in Center Hall, there are um, 30, I believe 34 flags hung up to represent the different um, nations in which students are born uh, from the high school. And um, Some students in the school have been speaking out about the dress code with a series of flyers put up around the school. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Um, but it's clear that there is a group of students in the school that do not support the code and the message it conveys to young women. And um, also, we just wanted to thank you for um, having us this year because it's been a truly exciting experience. And um, <laughs> it's been an enjoyable experience. And um, we wish you all the best in the future. So. Thank you. It has been unique. Yes. It, it has will, been unique. It will be a good graduate school essay one day. <laughs> Can I um, add that our student representatives are being very modest and they're not announcing certain things about themselves, such as Anna. Uh, what was your position on Honor Society? Uh, Vice President. Vice President. She sang the national anthem at the Honor Society induction the other night, sang it beautifully. And um, Elena Weissman is the salutatorian for the graduating class this year. So congratulations to both of you. I also want to um, announce that the Highland Park High School baseball team won the sportsmanship award for uh, Greater Middlesex County. So congratulations to Coach Blevins and all of the students on the high school baseball team. So for the last uh, meeting, we have our, our board recognitions, and so I'll turn it over to Dan at this time. So this is the sagging microphone. Um, 
I want to thank you all for coming, and this is a very exciting evening. There are a lot of very wonderful things for us to announce, and um, we are going to start by honoring our retirees, and what I'm going to be doing is calling up the principals of the buildings and some of the other folks to, um, to discuss each of these folks. So I'd like to first introduce uh, Mr. Israel Soto. Thank you, Dan. Coming up to render tribute to a woman who is uh, so multifaceted and has meant so much to the Bartle School community over the years is not an easy thing to do, particularly when faced with the milestone of retirement. Lauren Fraser came to the Highland Park from South Brunswick. She began her leadership career at Bartle as an assistant principal, and in 2005, she began a new journey as the instructional leader. As a principal, she could be seen greeting students in front of the building each morning, conducting classroom walkthroughs, and attending to the needs of students, teachers, and parents. Her relentless dedication to Bartle, her political savviness, and her ability to galvanize her teachers and staff to accomplish common goals gained her much respect from all who have come in contact with her. It is well known that Lauren has a gift of reflection and getting to the root of any problem the truth will prevail with Lauren. I would imagine the plethora of accolades that can be attributed to Lauren. However, in the short time that I have personally come to know her, I can say that her impact and multitude of roles reach far beyond the perimeters of a principal. She has played the role of investigator, of problem solver, a guidance counselor, marriage counselor, custodian, police officer, drill sergeant, poet, organizer, motivator, and for many, mother goose. And to think that she was able to accomplish all these roles and do it with such dignity, compassion, and aplomb is a tribute to her dynamic talents, not only as a leader, but as a human being. Lauren, you have much to feel proud of. Bartle has become the embodiment of its leader. It's a beautiful place where kids and adults flourish in an environment of respect, of honesty, of hard work, and intellectual inquiry. Pep rallies, crazy hat days, Halloween, and the word perseverance will never look nor sound the same. So today we honor you, Lauren, and hope that your life has been equally fulfilled as you fulfilled this community. Hopefully, your retirement would just be the beginning of you working on living instead of living for working. Congratulations, Lauren, on your new chapter in your life. Enjoy with your family, friends. God bless. Uh, I wrote something so I, I would say what I wanted to say, so forgive me for reading. I want to thank you, the community, for entrusting your children to my care over the years. This is a wonderful town, and I could not love your children more. Over the years, Bartle's families have demonstrated real generosity and concern for everyone's children, not just their own, and their support of our staff and the goals of our school have always been appreciated. A little over a week ago, I had the opportunity to thank my family and staff for their support and efforts, but I think it's important once more to publicly acknowledge the gift that is the Bartle staff. I witness on a daily basis their concern and hard work um, to make the children successful, both academically and emotionally. In all of my years at Bartle, I have seen the staff overrepresented in seeking out workshops to expand their skills. 
They even created their own professional book study groups. Year after year, I'm impressed to see them initiate summer team meetings to prepare for the next upcoming year. They do not do these things because they're asked to. They do it out of their desire to be the best they can be for their students. So I thank all of you for allowing me to grow professionally and to lead your school. Thank you. For our second retirement, um, I'd like to introduce the new Irving School principal, Kelly Wysozanski, to speak about Ellen Krant. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Ms. Cran has been an English as a second language teacher at Highland Park for 10 years. When speaking with her colleagues, they said that she always looked to improve her program. She actually enrolled in a music class at Ryder Westminster College so that she could infuse music into her classroom to make the students feel a little bit more comfortable. Uh, when I asked some students to tell me some things that they do and they like to do with her in class, one student said she played games with us. Another student said that they loved when she colored with them. And finally, one student said she lets me eat in class. And if you work with four or five and six year olds, you know that eating is important and it's, she, that's a big deal. Uh, we thank Ms. Krant for her dedication to Highland Park and we wish her well in her future endeavors. She will be missed. For the third uh, retirement, I'd like to introduce uh, Lauren Fraser to speak about Vicki Podebecki. Unfortunately, Vicki is not here, so she's not going to hear all the wonderful things I have to say about her, but <sighs> Vicki's been in, in Highland Park for 33 years. And she started out as a phys ed health teacher. Um, and it's really through Vicki's efforts and her partnership with Maurice Elias that led to our social decision making program in Highland Park. Um, it's a very big part of Bartle School, it's part of Irving School, and to some extent part of the middle school. Uh, Vicki had the opportunity to train scores of staff. Uh, as new people came in, she trained. And then she trained one-on-one -on -one when necessary. Fourteen years ago, or a little before that, um, Vicki got a new certification, and that was as guidance counselor. And so she took on that role, but before she did, in the summer leading into her first year, she was on an interview committee, and uh, she's really to blame for me being hired in this district. She was on that committee. And then uh, our very first year, we shared the office together, which was a great experience. Um, she's counseled students on loss, on friendship making, on emotional regulation over the years. I can't even begin to guess how many children she's impacted through, with her efforts, and parents as well. Um, she's not above meeting one-on-one -on -one with a parent to help them understand how to do their job a little bit differently some, and a little more effectively. She's also mentored well over 100 uh, Rutgers interns, whether they were the social problem-solving interns that came for a semester or the year-long counseling interns. She served as their mentor. She is Bartle's 504 uh, coordinator and the dreaded test coordinator, but she always brings a little levity to the occasion. She'll send out a daily poem to the staff to try to keep their spirits up as we review day after day. One day down, four to go. Um, Vicki's big shoes to fit, despite her small stance, she has big shoes to fill, fill rather. and. Um, I wish whoever takes over for her the best, but I know that Vicki is going to start a whole new career. Uh, Vicki never stopped learning. She continued to get degrees all the way up till I think about a year ago, 
when she, and now she is teaching at college, and I think she's going to start her own counseling. She's just a, a powerhouse. And so we will miss her at Bartle School, I know, but we'll get her to come and visit. Maybe she and I will come together. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Mike Lassiter to speak about Julie Klimowitz. I watched Ms. Klimowitz go, oh, as I was introduced to speak about her. But I have nothing but good words to share about Ms. K. As all of her students affectionately call her, she has worked in our district for 36 and a half years, serving the community as a health and physical education teacher. If you take a look at her, she is the epitome of how good exercise and healthy living keeps you young. She has been a coach of gymnastics, tennis, track, cheerleading, and all around sportsmanship and good manners in our students. She has also taught Teen Pep, our sex education advocacy program, which empowers high school age students to share information and present programs to their peers regarding their choices and the risks of those choices. Their t-shirts always quite, cause quite a stir in the uh, school each year. Ms. Klemowitz has taught at the high school and the middle school level and has impacted decades of Highland Park's children. All of her students express a great love for Ms. K and I witnessed students run up to her to share their accomplishments and concerns with her many times. She is a source of inspiration for them and a great motivator. She has taught many of our current students' parents, even some of their grandparents. <laughs> Ms. K is always quick to remind students of this when they make choices they may not be so good. A call home from Ms. K carries a lot of weight. She has looked out for each of our students and has mothered many of them through difficult challenges. Ms. Klemowitz is also a tremendous colleague and a strong supporter of her fellow teachers. She provides support and encouragement to new and veteran teachers to keep them focused on the needs of our school. She willingly shares her opinion with her colleagues and the administration. And there have been many administrations that have come and gone while she's been here. <laughs> Julie has outlasted them and remained a fixture in our school, providing her good-humored guidance to us all. She has also coordinated the HP Flower Fund for years in order to celebrate marriages, births, retirements, and to provide comfort during bereavements and illnesses. I don't know how we're going to give her her uh, reward uh, because she runs the HP Flower Fund. Personally, she has watched over me like a mother as well. She was one of the first to greet me when I came to Highland Park. She always was there to offer me support when I faced challenges or disappointments. She provided me guidance when I became an administrator, and she told me her opinions freely when I became her supervisor. <laughs> I have been to her house many times over the years to celebrate with colleagues as we approach the holidays and the end of the year, and I remember her home in those celebrations fondly. I have gained much from knowing Julie Klimowitz for these 20 years, and I will miss her dearly. Enjoy your time with your family and friends, and congratulations on your retirement and whatever you do next. Where's Jerry? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll just keep it short. I appreciate it. I have loved my time at Highland Park. It's ups and downs. Um, There's tragedies, the great things that went on. Um, but we pulled through. I don't want to spend too much time now. I'll come back later <laughs> with my complaints. Um, but I appreciate this. And I really, truly enjoyed um, everything that's gone on in Highland Park. I feel passionate about what I've done. Um, I think I made some kind of change in someone's life every day, and I hope that other people can do that too. Thank you.
Okay, we're now uh, moving forward to the Teacher of the Year uh, award winners for each of the buildings. And I'd like to introduce uh, Mrs. Weiss Suzanski to speak about Helen Ratke. She moved spots, now I see you, I see you. <laughs> uh, one of the first assemblies I attended at, when I came to Irving was our kindergarten living garden. Mrs. Radke had, had her guitar and she was leading the kindergarten in a beautiful song. The students were engaged and happy and I could tell she loved her job. When speaking to her colleagues, they mentioned that Mrs. Radke takes music very seriously. She is passionate about her music program and taught the children all different types of music. When asking the students about her, they were eager to share all their stories. Here are a few of them. I love Mrs. Radke because she taught me about music. I love Mrs. Radke because she teaches us about composers like Bach and Beethoven. I like music because of Mrs. Radke. This one was interesting. She taught us about cowboy music. Um, somebody else said, Mrs. Radke is funny. She does a dinosaur dance with us. And finally, someone said Mrs. Radke is kind and the best teacher ever. Congratulations on this achievement in your career. We can't wait to hear the beautiful music you continue to create in Highland Park. Congratulations. Next, I'd like to call back Lauren um, to speak about Mary Lewis. Uh, Mary, better known as May Lewis, uh, has been in Highland Park and at Bartle for 14 years, and I'm, never, I'm always amazed by her intellectual curiosity. Um, she really has a true desire to grow, and she's one of those people that initiated some of those book study groups. Uh, she often works with our most needy students. Um, and she actually welcomed the opportunity to share her classroom with another teacher and became a uh, collaborative classroom last year and continued to do so this year. This is a very isolated position, uh, profession, generally, and it's one teacher, 22, some odd 22 uh, students. So to open yourself up, expose yourself to another adult is, is, can be uh, a little jarring, but May's always well ready to try anything, and, and she did, and she found that she really enjoyed it. The important thing about May is that she knows how to take the lead in the classroom, and she understands how to take the supporting role as well. So it's a real collaboration. Not an easy thing to do for so many of us who are used to being the main attraction in the classroom. She uses data to guide her instruction and is really looking at each child as an individual to try to find what that child needs the most. She served on committees as long as she's been in the district but what always amazed me when I sat in on those committees is she's not afraid to ask the hard questions. She's not a shy person when it comes to that. She's very quiet normally, but she'll ask the very direct question, and I love that about May. She's helped the next generation as a cooperating teacher, taking on those student teachers. And finally, to quote one person that wrote about May in her nomination, it said, May Lewis is the type of teacher who does wonderful things for children, but doesn't ever call, call attention to herself. I think that's a really good description for May. And unfortunately, she cannot be here, but she did send me something and asked if I would read it to you, so I shall. She wrote, I am very sorry I couldn't be here this evening, but unfortunately I had to be in Ohio for a death in my family. I would like to express my sincere gratitude for this wonderful honor. I would like to thank the Bartle staff, and especially the third grade team, Josh, Barbie, Lauren, and Danielle, for their innovative teaching ideas and ongoing support. 
I'd like to send out a special thanks to Karen Cox, my teaching partner, for seeing things in our students that I don't always notice. She shows me how to be a better teacher and a better person every day. So congratulations, May. I hope you can hear me in Ohio. Okay, and uh, I'd like to bring up Mr. Lassiter to speak about the award winner for the middle school, Henry Dykeman. Henry Dykeman is an incredibly worthy, uh, worthy of this honor of Teacher of the Year for the middle school. He is the essence of what a history teacher is about. I've observed his class numerous times over the past five years, and I am always impressed by how engaging his stories of history and culture can be. Oftentimes, I've stayed longer than I probably should have listening to those stories. I've watched his students literally hang on his every word when he recounts the tales of knights, warlords, and other cultural information about medieval Europe, Africa, China, Southwest Asia, and Japan. Mr. Dykeman's classroom showcases his life as an educator. He hand-painted a map of these regions on his wall so he can refer to it often for the students and to provide students geographical context for what they study. He creates his own cartoons and comic books to provide a visual story of history, and the drawings he does on his whiteboard are amazing as well. His classroom is easily spotted from the outside of the middle school, one of the only ones you can spot from a distance because of the Chinese dragon he painted on the window. This is washed off each year and recreated painstakingly in the fall. <laughs> Mr. Dykeman not only engages his students throughout, through his powerful gift of storytelling, they research throughout the year, collaborate in debates and group assignments, and create their own history with personal projects like the coat of arms they developed for their annual shield project. It was a lot of fun for me uh, seeing our middle school cafeteria fill up with 130 uh, middle school students uh, waving their shields around. <laughs> He has also recently filled his classroom with all of his World War II artifacts and memorabilia, along with student docents he trained to transform Room 206 into a living museum dedicated to the history of this critical time in world history. The students marvel at the exhibit as they are led through it by students who recount the purpose and meaning of each artifact from memory. And we're talking of hundreds of artifacts that they all learn and are able to uh, describe and explain to their, their peers. The students love Mr. Dykeman. They love him for the passion he shows each day in his teaching. Henry's colleagues love him for the good man he is and the kind words and support he always gives to others. As an administrator, I respect and cherish, oh geez, no, I love him too, uh, because he strives to continually improve his craft and listens intensely to suggestions and critiques in order to grow as an educator. Henry will never be satisfied with the status quo. He always wants to do more for his students and the school. One step into his classroom and you would see that he fills every square inch of it with everything he possibly can to make history come alive in Highland Park Middle School. Okay, next I'd like to bring up Nicole Adams to speak about the High School Teacher of the Year Award winner, Todd Kruger. Good evening. So great teachers are change agents. They seek to form meaningful relationships with students. They seek to penetrate the rough exterior Sometimes that's discontent, sometimes that is that they're not engaged, and sometimes that they're just stubborn. Um, Mr. Kruger is that teacher. 
his students refer to him as a cool, funny guy who makes learning fun every day. His colleagues refer to him as someone who is dependable, someone who is a team player, and someone who is always, always looking out for what is in the best interest of his students. I contacted Dr. Williams and he wanted me to tell you, Mr. Kruger, that he has watched you evolve as an educator over time and you are so deserving of this honor and that he wants you to continue to be a light for new teachers. Your enthusiasm, your passion for education shines through every day and I couldn't agree more. So I, it is a pleasure to recognize you with this honor tonight. You are so deserving, so appreciated, and so worthy, and we thank you for all you do for our children every single day. Thanks a lot, Mr. Kruger. The next two people that, um, that will be recognized are not teachers, they are students. And um, we have a, a little thank you to Elena Weissman, who stepped out, and to Anna Milatich, who are our two student reps to the Highland Park Board of Education. Um, Anna and Elena have come to every meeting. They haven't stayed through to the end of every meeting, but they, they have uh, really made some very positive contributions. Um, we thank them, especially for their information that they've been able to bring regarding, you know, the things that students are thinking about, the things that students are participating in, and, um, you know, a lot of the feedback about what's happening in the school. So, I want to congratulate them. I also want to announce that Elena will be going to Brown University next year, and that Anna will be going to Brandeis University next year. So, without further ado, our two student reps. Last recognition, uh, is William John here? Oh. Would like to come on down? Yeah. Uh, so w we wanted to, to recognize your son uh, for being the 2014 U.S. Chemistry Olympiad. Uh, it's a great honor for the district. And then just one final uh, recognition again, um, the, the next year uh, student representatives will be Annie McCrone and Vivek Puduri. So if we could just give them a round of applause, we'll be seeing them. If you don't mind, I'd like to add uh, my two cents into this little event tonight. M Ms. K. <laughs> um, uh, tonight, tonight's very special you know, for all of us. I want to congratulate everybody retiring. Um, but like uh, the people who have come up to say, to come up today, uh, there have been a number of people who have had an impact on many people's lives within this district. Uh, Ms. Podebecki being one of them and Miss Kay uh, being another one. Um, I'm going to start the story by quickly telling a uh, you know, something that you, may, that you may not know, but 
I certainly remember, and it's something that I think anybody who has experienced something tragic like the JFK assassination or the Martin Luther King assassinations remembers where they were when that happened. I remember where I was when September 11th happened. I was in your classroom in health. So while we, you, you and I, you might not remember that, that's something that, some, that I remember and whenever asked me, if, and for years to come, I'll be able to tell that story. While you, that's not something that you personally did, there have been a number of things post-graduation and during, during school, where I know I'm not the only one who, who has experienced this, where you've had a measurable impact on their lives for the last 20, 50, 40, 30, 10, two years, whatever it be. And that can't be taken away from anybody and that's something that needs to be said to everybody about the great person that you are. And lastly, I can't wait to share a drink with you at the Marlin. <laughs> <laughs> I, to, th to this day, one of the best parts about getting people down to LBI is that I get to say, Miss Kay lives four blocks away from us. And my friends come down in droves just because they have a chance to hang out with or see her. So congratulations. I'm sure I'll be seeing more time of you, with you at the beach. And thank you for everything from me and from all the graduates. Okay, so um, we are going to go to the board committee reports. Claire? Uh, yes, the curriculum committee did not meet tonight. Uh, and from, oh, is that it? That's all I say, right? You can describe. Oh. <laughs> Uh, if you look at the agenda, there is, oh, I'm very excited about number two. Somebody was asking before about ELL and um, sheltered English, and that's exactly what this group does. Number two, the Language and Liter Literacy Associates, and I just had training by uh, these two women in New Brunswick as part of my professional development, and it was the best professional development I have ever had sponsored by my school district. So I'm thrilled that this was already in the works. Um, so that is very exciting. It's the model they um, are teaching. It's called shelter instruction. It's really basically PSYOP, but Pearson owns PSYOP now, so they can't say PSYOP because they don't work for Pearson. But it um, uses a lot of those materials. And what I love about it is it it uh, highlights best practices that work for all children. So it's really not just for English language learners, it's for all students and helping to make uh, teaching and learning accessible to all students. Uh, you can see there's other professional development items and curriculum writing, summer curriculum, teen center summer programs, more summer programs, and I believe that's it. Okay, is there any discussion on the curriculum items? I just had a quick question about two and three. I didn't get a chance to go back and look, but I do recall there was a two or three meetings ago we approved uh, another chunk of professional development from the Staff Development Workshops, Inc. of Lakewood. Um, and at that time I had asked if, you know, part of our professional development for next year is also going to be teacher-led. Um, and, you know, I, was, I, I feel like the response last time was that what we had approved a couple of meetings ago was kind of going to be the extent of us contracting out for professional development, and now we're contracting out for another 30,000 or so. Are, are we kind of at the end of that now, and some of the other professional development's going to be teacher-led, or? So, like we were talking about earlier during the board goals, you're talking about these are the, the major ones that we've contracted for the, the professional development days within the district. So the ones a few weeks, <clears throat> the, the last ones were 13, 14, this is 14, 15. Mm -hmm. So, and like I explained, all of the things that are building level are teacher led are in conjunction as far as um, with, with the building principal and the, the school improvement team. So more the, I'm sorry, were you not done? I don't want to cut you off. You were done? Yeah. So more the building level stuff is going to be more teacher driven and then more the district wide stuff is going to be more consultant? Is that the? 
I'm, or am I not understanding? That, that's that's what we've done as far as the plan for next year. That's correct. Okay. And is, would we look towards having? I mean, I'm, I'm just asking out of curiosity. Would we look? Would we look towards student or teacher-driven district professional development as well, or is that kind of the the foreseeable plan? We identify what the needs are, and then we schedule it accordingly. Anytime that you have somebody within the district that you can do a train-the-trainer model, that's obviously preferred because you have practitioners that are working within the population doing it. Uh, so that, that's always the preferred model. Um, again, th this is something that, uh, as with many things that we've discussed, we, we haven't had a plan in place. We're doing foundational items. Um, this is, uh, again, the, the district portion of it. The 23 meetings that we, we discussed earlier, those will be things that you would expect to see teacher-led that would be directly uh, impacted based on the things and the feedback that we receive from the buildings. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Is there any other discussion on the curriculum items? <coughs> Catherine, could we have the Finance Committee report? Yep, the uh, Finance Committee did not meet tonight. Um, let me draw your attention. Well, let me talk about some report items. Um, the Rod Grant update. Um, there was a project kickoff meeting last week. Um, with the architect and the contractor, probably there's going to be enough delay in actually making these windows um, that the project will extend into the fall and the work will be done after school, um, during after school hours. The custodial maintenance and landscaping services proposals will be opened on June 18th and recommendations should be coming to the board on the July 21st meeting. For agenda items, uh, Item number eight is the TEMCO extension, for the one month extension that we spoke about at the last meeting. Um, <laughs> items nine and 10, um, the computers, these computers are replacing outdated units which are not able to run the current software program and to provide all CS team members necessary computers. Items 11 and 12 are referring to Chromebook carts um, needed for middle and high school use. Item number 13 is the firewall, firewall filter VPN appliance that will replace an existing unit that needs to be replaced. Item number 14 um, is the balcony seating we've also spoken about in the last couple of meetings. It's being purchased through the Middlesex Regional Co-op bid. Um, any other work that's going to be done in that balcony will probably be quoted on and, and on the agenda for the July 21st meeting. Again, hopefully it'll uh, be done this summer. Items number 20 and 21 are standard year-end motions. I'm just going to read this from Linda. Emergency reserve is being replenished to cover future health benefit cost increases. Transfer to capital reserve um, was budgeted in part during the budget process in order to fund the Bartle window replacement project, and the remainder is a high estimate advised upon by the auditors who were in the building a couple of weeks ago to avoid any excess surplus, and based upon any remaining current year savings, we do not anticipate that we will have nearly enough to hit the threshold. It is up to that amount as a safeguard. Item number 26 is an emergent repair. Um, we did not have necessary indirect storage tanks for our hot water system in the middle and high schools, and it's a health issue. And item number 29 is the carpet replacement in the middle school high school media center, which is desperately in need of replacement, also being contracted through the Middlesex uh, Regional Co-op bid. Good. It is good. We yep. talked about that last year. Yeah. <clears throat> is there any discussion of the um, finance items? Yeah, I just want to talk about 20 and, tw 20 and 21. Um, the number is not from the number is not going to come close to 750 or 15 or or uh, 1,000 uh, 100,000 uh, dollars for for these two reserves. We don't have anything close to that. Uh, this is a total normal motion, and it is a safeguard. Um, but if we can get any money into capital reserve, I would be happy, um, and it would be needed. But I'm not too confident about that at all, but we do this every year. Is there any other discussion of the finance items? <clears throat> Anne, do we have um, the personnel committee report? Uh, yeah, do you want to talk about number one first? Why don't you, can, you can do the, anything that you'll discuss and then. 
Okay. Well, the, the personnel committee did not meet tonight. Linda, do I read in the correction now? Okay. So a uh, number of items, um, because we're at the sort of that time of the year for personnel where there's an awful lot of hiring going on. Um, there is a new uh, interim director of educational services um, uh, so that we can uh, take our time and conduct um, a, you know, a thorough search for the next person to permanently hold that position. Um, we have uh, um, a new Spanish teacher um, at Bartle School, and I need to make a correction to number four on the agenda. Um, uh, rather than step one, she will be starting at step nine, and her salary will be $62,638. So if you could make that correction. Um, we have a new physics teacher, um, uh, a number of new positions, um, and a couple of maternity leaves, and hmm? well, I, and, uh, and we, I'm sorry, sorry. So uh, uh, that's, that's about it. OK. Is there any discussion of the uh, personal items? So I will, uh, I'd just like to address number one in the personnel uh, and communication uh, report. Um, we will not be moving item number one. Um, we will not in the future be moving this gentleman um, for this position. I think that actually might be the first time I've said something and people have clapped, by the way. Um, we, uh, we're not going to discuss the item, and of course, because, we are, uh, because this is a personnel matter, we will not be commenting on it. If you'd like to make comment, uh, public comment with regard to, you know, to this uh, agenda item, you can feel free, but um, we will not be discussing it. We will not be responding to anything related to this, um, this item, um, but it will not be moved. And I also do want to um, just note number 10, uh, item number 10, the resignation of Michelle Callis. Um, Michelle uh, has done some excellent curriculum work here, and uh, we wish her the best in her, uh, in her new position. Is there any other um, discussion of the personnel and communication items? Adam, policies? Uh, the policy committee met um, last to last week, two weeks? Uh, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. <laughs> um, and discussed uh, Ms. Berkowitz's changes uh, to two policies. Uh, the policy committee, uh, uh, by a two to one vote, uh, rejected the changes. Um, and we have, no, uh, not, we have no changes to report or a policy for first reading for tonight. Um, I'm, Ms. Berkowitz, uh, I believe, will bring it up uh, during closed session, and we can discuss it further uh, at that time. Closed session? I'm sorry, during uh, committee. No, during um, new business. During new business. Or old business. Sometime, sometime later. Yeah. But Adam, future. can you just clarify what was discussed at the policy meeting? Yeah, uh, we discussed uh, a number of changes. I, I don't know if you want to, expl do you want to explain your cha the changes? We, we uh, discussed two primary changes, one making a three-minute uh, limit to all public, com com uh, to all public uh, comment, um, and the second uh, ending board meetings at, um, I believe, 11 o'clock by, by, by policy. But I thought what we I thought what was decided by the two to one vote was to not bring it up for first reading. The, no, well, we were not we're, we're not recommending a policy change. Is what the vote. But was. what Adam said to you was that um, that you were free to bring it because you were. I concerned. understand. I just wanted to clarify. I thought it was about whether or not we could bring it up for first reading. Well, if the board votes for it later, then it can be that can be first read. Right. So the, the committee has chosen policy. not to bring it up for uh, first reading. Any board member has the opportunity okay. Okay, to okay, present. I'm just yeah. clarifying that I wanted it brought up for first reading. Right. And that's what was. Uh, voted against. Right. Well, we, we, we yes, there was, we did not, besides first reading, we did not see that there was a need for a change. And that's why there was no, there was no need for a first reading. But we're welcome to have more discussion upon it, and if need, okay. need be, we'll address that later. Is there any other discussion of the policies? Okay, at this sorry. time, the Highland Park Board of Education, uh, welcome. Dan, sorry. Oh, I'm Just sorry, Darcy. With the public records one, hadn't we talked about 
it being formatted differently so that we could see what the changes were other than just the I thought we the agreed bolding, or did we agree to not? I thought we it. agreed that it was too much and that it was pretty much... The public records Oh, you're, talking, policy. you're not talking about what they were talking about? No, no, no. Oh, no. okay. You're talking about the item. The one policy was an almost a total rewrite. Okay. And to put strike-ins, things were moved into different places, and it was just, it was too difficult to actually show bolds and strike throughs So gotcha. we did present to you the old one, so you could put it side by side with the new one mm -hmm. at the last meeting. Mm -hmm. So... Okay. There were no changes at that time, and then therefore we brought it forward for second reading tonight. Okay. And as we discussed, the only substantive change to the policy was basically the inclusion of email OPRA requests, and then everything else yeah. is just statutory. And, right. Well, it's all statutory uh, OPRA um, required language um, with regard to you know, the, the costs and the, just the way you can disclose the uh, information. or make the information public. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other discussion of the policies? This time the Highland Park Board of Education welcomes public participation and has reserved this time for your comments. I would like to make a motion uh, as per bylaw 0167 to limit the length of each public comment to three minutes. Is there a second? Second. Linda? Ms. Aversa? Yes. Ms. Berkowitz? Yes. Ms. Bull? Yes. Ms. Simarusti? No. Mr. Ross? Yes. Ms. Sherber? Yes. Mr. Sherman? No. Mr. Borden? Yes. Kimberly Bevilacqua Crane, president of HPEA, speaking as president of HPEA. First, I would like to applaud the recommendation of contract renewal for teacher Barbara Kausch. This action illustrates that the administration heard our concerns about her non-renewal and took into consideration the association's request for invest investigation into the issues that deal specifically with our members' employment. Um, we, would <clears throat> we also appreciate the board's decision to continue to investigate options for the high school principal. This is the last board meeting before the summer intermission and prior to our, and the one last one prior to our next contract mediation on Thursday, June 19th. We have asked our membership to join us tonight as they will on Thursday to show their support and interest in moving forward with the contract settlement. We also felt it would be productive for our members to view the board's goal setting process and provide constructive input on your progress during public comment if they wish. I would like to talk about our members for a moment. We have an incredibly knowledgeable, dedicated, and hardworking group of professional educators on staff in Highland Park. These are people that I am not only honored to represent, but also fortunate to work alongside. These are employees who come in early, stay late, take work home, attend ac after school activities, and plan together over breaks, weekends, and the summer unpaid to support their students and the greater school community. Some of them are in the audience right now, working on grades as I speak. There is truly not enough time in the day to accomplish what is necessary. To give extra time to their work is the norm among our members and not the exception. I have worked in districts where it was an exception, and at 3.30 you could hear the crickets chirping. Not all educational professionals hold themselves to the standard of excellence our staff expects, although so they should. Many would like to, but their districts have crammed more students, more instructional time, more test prep, more administrative directives into their day to the point where everything that is not Common Core directed must be jettisoned because we have reached the tipping point where something has to give. Until someone figures out a way to bend the space-time continuum, we will continue to only have so much time. As educators, we appreciate efficiency. We understand time management and we despise ineffective practice and programs that lack rigor. We are hard on ourselves and each other when a lesson doesn't go as planned or a workshop wasn't presented according to our standards, but we also recognize the need for balance. We set high expectations for our students with the realization that they too have limits and it is imperative to their education that we understand where their learning stops and where the overburdening begins. 
We have been through much this year, well beyond what has been asked of us in the past. We have been presented with new and challenging deadlines and have met them. We have said goodbye to the majority of our administrators and welcomed new ones with an open mind. We have restructured our association out of necessity after the elimination of our president and vice president with the goals of communication, collaboration, and community outreach as our driving force. Most of us consider Highland Park our second home, and for many of us it is home. The investment that you have from your employees goes far beyond the minutes of the workday or contractual obligation. Giving our students above and beyond of our time, expertise, and dedication is not something that we do because our contract says so. This is something that we do because we support each other, we are invested in this community, and we care very deeply about your children because for seven days, seven hours out of the day, they are our children too. So we adjourn for, as we adjourn for the summer, please keep in mind that we are anxiously awaiting a settled contract, a clear schedule, and solidified job assignments so we may continue to plan in a manner that best supports our students and the educational goals of our district. We trust that you will do everything in your power to work with us and to provide us with these essentials as soon as possible. We have met all of the challenges that we have been presented. We will continue to do so. We are the perpetual motion behind the excellence of education in Highland Park Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Denise May Fryer, 314 Wayne Street. Uh, first of all, I commend you for withdrawing number one on the personnel. Um, a little due diligence would realize why you shouldn't hire this individual. A little search by us, we realized he's bounced all over creation from one job to another. Um, a little Googling leads you to see that on his Twitter account, he follows a site called Maxim, which has site, uh, pictures of young women in their 20s in immodest clothing, maybe, or bikinis. Uh, another one of the hashtags that he, or one of the other uh, things he follows is called Hot Topic at Noon, which is a bunch of young women who upload pictures of themselves for the viewing of whomever, including this person. Um, on Facebook, there he is, hanging out with a picture with a glass of wine or some kind of booze. I mean, I'm not objecting to people drinking, but really, I think teachers have been, uh, had problems with this in other school districts. So, I commend you for doing that, because our teachers and our students deserve you, deserve you hiring people who are worthy, not people who might be associated with Mr. Capone, who graduated from William, William Wilmington University with him when he graduated, or around the same time, same time frame. I don't know if they're friends, I don't know, I don't care. I just question it. Anyway, uh, so on to something else related to the degradation of women. Uh, I think that the policy regarding clothing in the schools, the middle school and the high school, should be addressed and discussed. It has come to my attention that a female student in the high school was uh, humiliated by being told she looked sexy or something. There is a policy going on right now. My children seem to be confused about it in the middle school. I would like you to discuss it. Um, regarding the ending at 11 o'clock, uh, I really hope that you put the kibosh on that. Um, I understand uh, Ms. Berkowitz's desire to end at a civilized hour, but you know, you shouldn't cut people off. And I hope, going back around to the principal again, I really sincerely hope that you 
choose somebody more appropriate. I know you're not going to answer this. I would like to know who's on your committees and how are the committees selected? Uh, again, I know you're not going to answer that, but I'm throwing it out there. I think we all deserve better than your choosing, including the superintendent. Thank you. Elena, can I just, Elena, you had, uh, you had made the comment about the dress code. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Because I, I don't know anything about it, and I'm not sure that the board is too aware of what's been going on. Yeah, basically there's been a series of flyers that have been put up. They've been anonymous, and they haven't been approved by Mr. Soto or anyone else. Um, and it's not really clear which students put them up, but they basically complained about the dress code. And it said that, um, that um, certain girls in the school did not feel comfortable with it, along those lines. And then, in the negative or in the positive? Right. Do they want it? Do they want it more liberal or do they want it more conservative? They want it more liberal. Um, I don't know if Mr. Soto. Have you seen them? Yes, I have. Yes, can you maybe. can you address it maybe? In the has it changed? Has the dress policy changed in the last no. ten years, five years, three years, two years? No. No. So we've been we've been trying to address the issue of the dress code where uh, you know, many adults feel that some of the students are dressing inappropriately uh, to come to school. And as a result, we've been seeing a lot of signs up about um, you know, their, their discomfort and, and you know, just complaining about the dress code. Um, quite frankly, many of the signs are very inappropriate. And so as soon as they come up, I've asked the custodial staff to take them down. And so. Um, they, clearly, we need to address the dress code um, quickly. Yeah, but I, I don't. I, so you, the signs are going up that it's want it, They want it more liberal. The staff, I believe, is saying they want it more conservative. I don't understand what the issue is with the present dress code. Well. well I, I, so I have to tell you, this has always been an issue for me. The, the dress code is much more onerous for girls in the high school than it is for boys. Much more of the, um, of the dress code addresses what girls can and can't wear than, than what boys can and can't wear. And so to me, that is sort of a basic inequi inequity. I'm, you know, I understand the need to sort of, um, you know, kids can't come to school dressed like they're going to the beach, but but there, but there does need to be um, some equity in, in the dress code, which there is not right now. You're absolutely correct. I, I agree. There, and that's been one of the concerns addressed by, by many of the girls. And you know, certainly I've, I've witnessed that also. So there, there needs to be some type of equity amongst you know, So maybe uh, the, the kids. policy committee can meet and discuss yeah, the dress absolutely. code. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Well, is the dress code in a policy? Or actually, is it no, in a the student dress handbook? code is actually is in the handbook. Yeah, it's right. the handbook. Mm -hmm. So maybe this summer we should look at that and right. try to get some feedback about, I mean, before you guys go, about right. the experience that you've had and maybe Absolutely. give some of that feedback to Mr. Soto. But, but no, no, no changes to policy should, or the handbook should be made without a board consultation. I, I think some of the issues with, with the dress code too is just that it was, it was, it was never really in, enforced or addressed as much as it should be or as it has been. So maybe like that's, you know, not creating confusion, but it's just bringing like a lot of attention to it. Because while I mean, I agree with Anne, there is a lot of inequities, but you know, there's, you know, there's still have, they still have to dress appropriate, but. I mean, we've got to pick up, we have to pick our battles. Well, exactly, also, You know, exactly. is this really what we, we want to fight about? Yes. Yes. Well, it should be fair. I mean, if it's. I agree with Anne, yeah. It should be fair. Right, it just, it just needs to be fair and it needs to be clear and then it needs to be. Enforced. Enforced yeah. and consistent. There's yes. been no consistency. Yes. That's, that's the, yeah, that's There's the been no consistency with yeah. it. So I think that that's what's, you know, okay. all of a sudden just causing a little bit of an uproar with the students. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Allison Salerno. I live at 66 Grant Avenue. Good evening and thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm here to talk about our family's experience with opting out of standardized tests specifically the state biology competency test, a four-hour test that happened in May. I want to urge you to adopt a written policy on how to handle students who refuse standardized tests and to make sure that policy conforms to the Department of Ed's expectations. As part of that policy, please train your faculty and staff to respect the choices that families and children are making and to educate them that they should not be making negative comments to students who choose this route. 
I want to also say I appreciate Mr. Dietz and Ms. Chimarusti's understanding that this board needs a written policy on test refusals that respects students and complies with DOE expectations. Weeks before the test, my husband and I let Mr. Soto know our ninth grader would be refusing the test. We were advised that our son could either sit and stare for four days, the two days of testing and the two days of makeup testing, or he could be absent for testing and sit and stare for two days of makeup testing while his classmates attended regular classes. When my husband and I talked to Mr. Soto, and uh, Mr. Soto made it clear he was enforcing an unwritten policy that Mr. Capone and Ms. Callis had created, and he suggested we email her with our concerns about our son missing hours of instructional time. We emailed her and we never heard back. I come to you tonight to let you know about a May 6th memo from a county school superintendent in another part of our state. Again, this memo came out 15 days before the state bio test. It says, in part, um, the school district does not have to provide something else for the child to do. He or she should be in test setting, but this is a local decision. It also says, if the child whose parent is opting out comes in during makeup week, you do not have to test the child, okay? Mr. Ross and Mr. Sherman have made it clear they do not want the board to adopt a written policy for test refusal so as not to encourage children and their families to refuse these tests. This trend toward test refusal, however, is not going away. Next year's high school students will fa face nine separate testing days per park. I believe it's like in a six week period. It is borderline malfeasance for this board to encourage a situation where my child and other children are denied access to instructional time in an effort to send a punitive political message to the children's parents. My husband and I are still puzzled how forcing our son to miss classes, including an important master corral rehearsal and an end of unit test on To Kill a Mockingbird, meets the requirements of his IEP. Finally, I would like to say that your resolution this spring expressing concern about standardized tests is empty rhetoric. My husband and I will remember on election day how this board allowed and perhaps even encouraged Mr. Capone and Ms. Callis to deny our son and other students access to academic classes. Hi, my name is Anna Perea and I live at 344 Baker Street. Um, I want to second everything that Ms. Crane said uh, on behalf of the teachers, so like eloquently and so movingly. Um, I, I wish the board creates channels for talking to teachers because they're our more precious resource. Um, and uh, I uh, hope that the conversation on communication continues, that uh, um, you know, distinction is made between disseminating information, which I think the district does very well extremely well and two-way communication it's a very different process and we absolutely absolutely need that two-way communication um, to be established we would avoid a lot of conflicts a lot of disagreement a lot of lengthy board meetings um, if we had that type of setting uh, there was a pill attempt to do that in um, November where we we're in the midst of a big conflict due to the rifts. Uh, we had this um, uh, strategic planning meeting. I uh, didn't attend that meeting. I, I read the, the summary. Uh, I failed to see the articulation between that strategic planning meeting and what I've heard refer several times in the earlier meeting as the strategic planning um, initiative. Uh, but. Uh, Mr. Capone's vision 2020. I think I've also seen in the um, uh, goal setting part of the meeting, Mr. Capone's, I would say, personal agenda bleeding into the board's goals, uh, its language being inserted into the board goals. I've also seen the board trying to revise that language by inserting, for instance, communication, which Mr. Capone kind of forgot about in his um, vision 2020 presentation. Anyways, I want to thank you. 
as a board for being so patient. We've been a real pain as a community. Uh, it's our duty. Uh, we'll, continue, we'll continue to do so. So, you know, it's in everybody's best interest to establish the best possible channels for communications. And I think that idea of having the shareholders' meetings, um, you know, in the process of revising the goals um, and um, the um, objectives uh, is a great idea. Now, I want to point to uh, an item in your bylaws that um, I would be happy if somebody read it. It's in your bylaws. It's called the 0134 Board Self-Evaluation. It's, it's from January 2004. I want to make sure it's still active because I didn't see much of it um, in the meeting today. Uh, that might have happened in another meeting, and I might have missed it. But I don't have time to read it all. I'll pass it around. I'll read the beginning and the end. It says, the Board of Education is committed to the belief that every part of the school system in this district should be accountable to the public, and that performance evaluation is essential to that accountability. And in, it ends like that. The assessment of board members will be tabulated and presented for discussion at a regular meeting of the board in which the superintendent will be inv invited to participate. The board will formulate, as appropriate, goals and priorities that will serve to guide the board in the ensuing school year. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Oh, someone, someone. She took this can just it. check. Uh, it's the second time. <laughs> I'm not a public speaker, but I promised my daughter I would do this. Okay. Um, I'm talk like if you, talk if you just, just hold on one sec, because uh, you do need to uh, sign in and state your name and your address. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Carla Draper, and I live at 126 Amherst Street. I'm here to talk about concussions. Um, concussions have a profound effect not only on the person suffering with the symptoms, but also everyone surrounding them, including parents and family, coaches and teachers. And that is why I'm asking Mr. Capone and the board to think about implementing comprehensive education on concussions for coaches, teachers, and staff. A concussion is a form of traumatic brain injury. It can be caused by a direct blow to the head or to an indirect blow to the body and more than three million concussions occur each year in the United States. Once a person has had a concussion, they are three times more likely to have another. It is especially important to understand the effects on children and adolescents as their brains are continuing to develop. Studies have shown that children who have had multiple concussions are more likely to suffer long-term neurological deficits. In the first weeks after the injury, most individuals experience physical symptoms such as headache, light and noise sensitivity, dizziness and fatigue, cognitive symptoms such as, shuts, uh, such as trouble with memory, concentration and fogginess, emotional symptoms such as anxiety, irritability and sadness, and one of the things we saw was a total personality change. Most people fully recover in three to six months. With individuals who have had previous concussions, it takes longer to recover. Up to 20% of concussion patients develop post-concussion syndrome, where the symptoms of the concussion can linger up to a year. This is the reason teachers and staff also need to be educated about concussions. The effect of a concussion is seen when a student exerts himself physically as well as cognitively. A concussion, a, a concussion affects the brain's ability to function, including slowing processing speed, causing defi deficits in concentration and memory, deficiencies in attention and organization. Common classroom activities can exacerbate symptoms and slow recovery time. The fluorescent lights and noise in hallways alone during class changes can be unbearable. The focus on concussion recovery is usually return to play. We also need to focus on return to school. The first step is reduce cognitive activity. The second step, educate yourself and others about the effects of concussions. 
The third step is accommodate to assist recovery. And the fourth step is pace the student's full return to phys physical and cognitive activities. Effective concussion management is a group effort, and I hope that as a district, we can continue to support our students in their recovery. And I'd like to thank Ms. Longo for her help and support, and to all of Olivia's teachers for working <coughs> with her. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, Carla, if I could just say, my, my family and I wish, uh, wish you the best for Olivia's recovery. Good evening, my name is Ellen Leibowitz. I live at 250 Grant Ave. Um, I wanted to start by thanking uh, everyone who helped out with this Saturday's um, annual Great Taste event, a Great Taste of Music event. It was the sixth annual. Um, it was a really wonderful evening. Um, thanks to the incredible music teachers. Um, to the student volunteers and performers, and of course to everyone who attended, some board members, thank you so much for being there. Um, a lot of people, uh, a lot of speakers at the board me me little meetings often start with sort of their Highland Park history, and I've never felt compelled to do that, but for some reason, I do now, so. Um, I've been involved with public school education in one way or another for over 30 years. We've lived in Highland Park for almost 25 years, and I've been an active parent in the district since our oldest, older son started pre-K here 17 years ago. He's now about to be a senior at Rutgers, and our younger son is just finishing his first year at the high school. There have been ups and downs, with various aspects of our son's educational experiences here. The ups have been mostly due to the incredibly wonderful and talented teachers we have here in Highland Park, and there's a lot of them here tonight. Mrs. Patichow, Mr. Esteban, Ms. Marioni, Ms. Ms. Ah, Senora, Gabriella, uh, uh, Tara Giovanetti, oh gosh, Ms. Botvinik, Mr. Mladnik. Thank you guys so much. Um, really. I don't want to leave anybody out. Ms. Crane, Mr. Maladnik, Mr. Presti. Um, thank you. We can't, we can't do this without you. Um, and there have been some downs, um, and I wanted to just talk about a couple of things. Um, I'm not going to list all the specific concerns that I currently have. Many of them have been mentioned at these meetings throughout the course of this school year. But I do want to say that I care deeply about our school district, and I am concerned about the state of things and some of the direction that we're taking. There are two recent events that are examples of the kinds of uh, some of the concerns I have. One of them happened a few weeks ago at a board meeting, and I haven't had a chance to get here to talk about it, um, but here I am tonight. Um, one of the student representatives um, in their report asked, uh, mentioned that their classmates were concerned that the high school principal had left and that there didn't seem to be anybody in charge in the building. What I was struck by was that neither the superintendent or any board member responded to the student's concern. The student's expression of concern was met with complete silence. There didn't seem to be any understanding that it would be important to offer an immediate response to the student rep. I wondered if this was really the example we want to be setting for our students. And it seemed to me to be an illustration of the general lack of response that many of us felt throughout this past year. And the lack of response was to a student, which in my mind made it even worse. 
In the end, it took an outcry from the public and staff before an interim principal was assigned to both of the buildings that were left principalless this year. And, you know, it just sort of makes me question the leadership that doesn't understand the need for that. Ellen, um, Ellen just please be aware of the time. Thank I'm, you. I may need somebody's three minutes. If somebody can <clears throat> give me that, please, thank you. I'm not, I'm not going to be much longer. Um, the second event uh, concern I wanted to talk about um, had to do with the um, item one on the agenda, and, and I really am glad to see that that's not happening. Um, I wanted to say to Denise, who asked about the search committee, that uh, you know the members of a search committee do not necessarily guarantee the result of the search. Um, it has to do, in my opinion, much more with the search process as a whole. Um, and um, I'd like to make some suggestions about search processes because I don't think they've gone very well uh, in the recent past. Ellen, if you could just... I'm sorry? If you could... Your, your time has uh, concluded. Could somebody so. give me three minutes, please? <clears throat> Won't be more than that. Thank you. Thank you. It takes time to name all the great teachers we have in the room today. Sorry. Rebecca Chapman Smith, 123 Magnolia Street. Okay, so suggestions about search committee process. Um, I'd like to suggest that there should be a minimum of two people screening initial candidate resumes. I'd like to suggest that members of the search committee should include a representative from the board's personnel committee. I'd like to suggest that search committee members should be informed if a candidate has worked with or has any connection to a current district employee. I'd like to suggest that the hiring schedule, whenever possible and appropriate, should, over, it should include overlap time with the previous administrator. And I believe that this arrangement has not been made with the outgoing and incoming Bartle principal, which quite honestly I find to be outrageous. And boy, we've come full circle because I was on the search committee for Lauren Frazier. Um, that worked out pretty well. Um, um, I'd also su suggest that um, no candidate should be brought forward to the committee who clearly does not have the appropriate skills or experience for the job they're applying for. I don't know why that would happen. Um, I, I'd like to suggest that candidates must be carefully vetted. And lastly, hiring the right candidate must always, always take, take precedence over expediency. Problematic searches lead to problematic situations and employees. The recommendation, I'm going to skip that part, we, um, we took care of that, thankfully. Um, but with the challenges we are facing in our district, we need the most excellent leaders and staff, and we really have to do better. Um, I'm going to skip all this because uh, we took care of that. Um, so to the board members, I know that you all love our town and love our schools as much as everyone else in this room. So I'm just going to end with a question, with two questions. I'd like to know first what the current plan is um, are we reopening the search? What the, what's the timeline? Um, what's the net, what are the next steps to replacing the high school principal? And lastly, um, another question is, um, I'd like to know where we are in the review of the superintendent's contract, what the time frame is for that, 
how that happens and when we'll hear back about that, when the public will hear about, back about that. So thanks so much to the board members again for, for being on the board. It's, um, it's not an easy job, I know. I really appreciate the time you give to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. And I, I, I would appreciate answers to those two questions. The time frame for what's, what's happening with the search, is it going to be reopened, and about Mr. Capone's contract coming up for renewal. I don't understand, I don't understand the well, the, so the time frame, so we're, we're, we will be continuing the high school's principal search. We're not sure exactly of what the next steps will be, but we, you know, that position is still open and we'll be taking the steps to, to fill that position soon. with a qualified candidate. Hopefully soon, but obviously, as you said, um, it's important to get someone who is the best candidate for the position, not someone who's just available or can, can begin soon. Um, as for your second question, um, there is no um, public discussion of the superintendent's evaluation. That's something that is um, discussed by the board. That's not what I asked. I asked when the process is happening and how that works. The process is according to the contract, and um, you know that information is kept within the board and the superintendent. Okay, and also I, I hope that you know, uh, and I'll be happy to give it to you in hard copy, that you'll think about some of the suggestions I made about the search. Yeah, process. If you could send it to us, that'd be great. I sure will. Thank you, Ellen. Jason Marsh, Jason Marsh, 418 South 4th Avenue. Uh, I'd like to read from an email that came out this week, this past week, pardon me, from uh, Bartle Paperless. In part it says, the superintendent's office has postponed the assigning of teachers to classes until after the school year ends. The staff has worked together to build next year's classes without the consideration of who the teacher might be and that information will be sent on to central administration. I will also send along uh, the input I received from parents that might impact placement. It is my understanding that you will be informed of your child's teacher for the 2014-2015 school year later this summer. My question is, what does the central administrative office know about my child and the other children in the class in terms of assignment of teachers that the principal, the guidance counselor, Ms. Shimon, what does the central administrative office know that, that the principal doesn't? You can be rest assured, Jason, I will not be assigning teachers or students to classes. Okay, who will be, please? At the point that we're ready to release that information, okay, we've had input from the staff, okay? There are a new principal at Irving, there's a new principal coming in at Bartle, and I believe it's appropriate to release those together. So at the point that it's done, that's when it'll be released. So the principal who doesn't know any of the staff nor any of the children will be making those assignments? As I said, when it's finished, it will be released. Of course, it's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's absurd to think that the new principal is going to make all of the assignments. So the teacher input, you know, the, the work that's been done is obviously going to be the most important thing that, that, is, that is used uh, in those assignments. Okay. Okay? Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I have to say, I'm still perplexed. Uh, that, the question, the answer, they don't jibe. Schedules are done. When the schedules are done, they'll be released. But we're breaking with what has traditionally been done in Bartle, which is mm -hmm. the teacher assignments are out that. with the report some cards. Some years yes, some years no. That's we not didn't, always been true. We didn't say that. Yeah, that is what has been said. The question, the question is, what, is, what does the statement mean in the email? I think that's, that's the question. So what does it mean that they were sent to the central office? I, I actually, I actually don't know why that was sent out. Um, that's not something that you know. There, there's no placement being made from that standpoint. Um, 
again, we're holding this information and we're, we're looking at the programs that are district-wide that are overlaid uh, and making sure that uh, staffing, uh, because of the changes that have occurred and that within the new schedule, because it has to be coordinated between Irving and Bartle, that it's done at the same time. Okay, so the, so the Bartle is not scheduled on its own because they're shared staff, and so both Irving and Bartle placements have to be considered together. Correct. Okay. One developed master schedule. Okay. So, so this is a result of schedule changes? Is that what, what I heard you say? That it's the teacher schedule changes? There's a staffing component. There's a scheduling component. There's a district component as far as coordinating the schedules between the two buildings. Okay? When all of those things are worked out, then the information will be released. Like I said, I will not be placing kids in classes. So the, the translation would be then that there are going to be changes because if there were not changes, we would be working under the same process that has existed previously. So am I to assume that you're saying there will be changes to the schedule and to the staffing? With, with, we, we, with, we've class, already... size, with class sizes and enrollment, it, they change every year. And, and we've already talked about this, of moving right. to common planning, and we've talked about that, that, that it's going to be set up differently, and that we were more efficient with staffing. This was covered months ago. We want to make sure every staff has a full load. Is that pretty much? This has more to do with sharing staff between the two buildings and providing common planning for staff. We've discussed this. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I, okay, thank you. Just to follow um, Anna, if, up. Yes, if, can I speak again? It's just a follow-up question. You have to I want to make sure. You have to state your name again. Oh, and yeah, it's written. I wrote it. Anna Pere, me again, 344 Bartow. It's just to follow up. I want to make sure that the, it is legal. Um, the information we provided, the parents' kind of um, profiles that we evaluated the needs of our children as far as we could tell. That information was not meant for central administration. Sometimes you say things about your children that are very personal um, and um, we trust there's things you can tell your teacher. I mean, they go to the classroom teacher, they go to the principal. We trust the principal that we know with, with, with uh, whom we have a relationship. We trust the teachers to make the best decisions and, and we trust them to keep this information confidential. This information uh, should remain uh, protected to some extent. It is not meant, people brought that, those, um, people gave that information under the assumption that it will, they will not warn that it would be read by central administration. They might say things about the teacher in a certain context that will be misread, that can be used against the teachers. Okay, so I'm just telling you, I, in my opinion, the, the district should now should redo, recall all those, all those um, worksheets that we were given and ask parents, tell parents what this information is going to be used for and um, ask them to redo. I know it's not realistic, but it's what you can't just change the rules in the middle of the process. That's all I'm saying. Okay? I don't think anybody's saying that. Oh. Well, we just changed the rules in the middle of the process. Maybe it was discussed at the meeting, we didn't understand what was going on. Okay, I, wanna, I also think it's irresponsible that um, all these results in, teach, in, in teachers learning, um, you know, in the middle of the summer, what grade they, they're going to be teach. I mean, how can they prepare efficiently to teach if they don't know until the end of July or maybe August what grade? Uh, in which building they're going to be teaching. I, I really think this is irresponsible. It's never happened. Are there I any mean, grade level changes for next year that, that you can describe for us? Because you're, you're saying a lot of things, and what you're saying yes. is, is not accurate. Right. right? Okay, what you're, what, uh, you're, you're basically saying that the teachers have had no input and that that is the oh, major no, 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 change no. in the process, uh, and no, that's just not true. Not at all. No, I no. think what, what, what the superintendent's saying is that there's another level that's, that's being looked at in order to provide common planning time for the teachers at Bartle. In order to do that, the schedule has to be looked at so that the people that are shared between Irving and Bartle, that their schedules can be aligned so that all the teachers in Bartle have common planning time. And so the teacher recommendations for which students will go to which teachers, it's not like that goes out the window. The teachers know those students the best. And so that is the primary thing that, that can I, please? Yeah, yeah she's explaining. Um, the, the primary thing that, that you know, guides those placements is exactly that. 
The only thing that's being overlaid then is to ensure that, you know, if you can have, let's say, 95% or something of those uh, recommendations can be followed in order to provide, you know, common planning time and, you know, the proper balance between the shared staff, then that's, what, that's what's going to happen. And to misconstrue it that way in the, in the sense that there's no teacher involvement and that all, everything needs to be recalled, I don't think that that's fair and it's not accurate. Mm -hmm. Except I didn't say that. I'm, I'm very, I think Mrs. Fraser's uh, statement said that, uh, that the staff has constructed the groupings. I've confirmed this information. I know the staff, the teachers have made the groupings, but I know that central administration, they have not assigned the teachers. I know that central administration will be assigning the teachers. The result of this is that teachers won't know um, what class, what grade they're teaching until the you know, the very end of the summer. Therefore, they cannot prepare adequately. That, that, I mean, That's that, not that true. assumption is just not true. It's not true. No. So when will, let me ask you, when will teachers know what they're teaching? When will they be informed of their teaching responsibilities? What's the date? Again, there's a scheduling component. Okay. Oh right. There's a staffing component. Okay. okay. We've had changes as far as what staffing okay. exists. When you have people going back into positions, okay, you have to take into consideration what their certifications are. So you have to consider movement. You have to consider where those people are as far as what their certificates say. So as soon as we can get that out, that's when it'll be released. I don't have a timeline. I'm not going to. I'm not going to say it's going to be done by this deadline. Sure. Okay. As soon as it's it's released, it'll and, be released. And we're not but, done but hiring. This, also, this, okay. this, this is. This is the same process that you go through every year. Every year. You look at those components. The difference being this year is, again, making sure that Irving and Bartle are on, are on the same schedule, that they have common planning for those teachers, and that the specialists are shared. Mm -hmm. I, That's I, the difference. Thank you. I, I understand the perspective of the administration. I think you should acknowledge a little bit the perspective of, of the parents. And uh, I'm not looking at kids' folders. I'm not looking at assignments, okay? I don't know why she sent out that email. I can't speak to that email. Well, I can't. Th thanks, thanks. Uh, we're glad that email was sent. I mean, the last thing we would want to know is, is the last thing we, is, I mean, just imagine if we learn in September how kids have been, how teachers have been assigned to. It's not no. going to be September. No. Okay. okay. Well, I, I think, you know, I Ellen think, spoke to this. I don't know where she went. This. Ellen Lipowitz spoke to this a, a couple, a few meetings ago, you know. More information keeps anxiety down, right. less information increases anxiety. I think that's what we have. Parents received this very odd email about their students' placements. Bartle parents were expecting, as has been, I mean, you might say this doesn't always happen, but I think in the recent, few, in recent past, end of the year, you receive your child's teacher assignments. Lack of information increases anxiety. It's yeah. that simple. It's that simple. For many yeah. years, they came right before school started. Right. I, I, used, okay, to get mine in, I used to get mine in August. But, like, while I was but in camp. there's a difference between this is now how we're going to do things from here out to just an odd email comes out, things aren't happening the same way, things are going to be... It, it created anxiety. It's true. If, it's if, true. If something very concrete went out and said, we're still working on the schedules, this will be to you by, you know, we're hoping by X date, Instead, a bunch of questions came out in an email that weren't answered, and now people are coming, and the answers aren't much clearer. So you're asking parents well, in you're a year full date. of a lot of unanswered questions to now go home with a lot of still what to me is unanswered questions well, about answer, where the their answer, kid the is going to be placed next year. The answer is absolutely clear. When the process is complete, it will be done. It will be passed on to the parents. It's absolutely clear. W what answer do you want to give? Do you want to say the end of June? That's not true. August, that's not true either. It'll be wow. as soon as it's done. It's a priority to get scheduling done, to get all the staffing in place. That's a priority. And when it's done, it'll be released. Well, I have to say when the message is delivered in that fashion, sir, it's very hard to take it what? seriously. <laughs> it, that, <laughs> Thank you, Anna. What process, what would you like to define yeah, for what? them, Darcy? What do you want to define? What I would like to define is a, even if it needs to be approximate timeline of when parents and students, because you now also have students who for the last few years remember 
that at the last day of school they got their teacher assignments and now they're being informed that they're not going to have their teacher assignments. So parents would like to know what to expect for themselves and they would also like to be able to tell their children what they can expect. What they can expect is not to have them at the end of the school year. What? That's not the same as knowing what to expect, not knowing what not to expect. <laughs> We don't have report cards either. So you're, you're basically saying we don't know. Sometime between now and the end of summer, teacher assignments will come out for Bartle. And that could even be the answer. At Irving, parents are accustomed to you don't get your assignments until the end of the summer. That would have been a, a perfectly reasonable response, I think, to say we're very sorry for a number of scheduling reasons. We're not prepared to give out class assignments at the end of this year. They will be given out by August 15th. Even if you just put a date on it when the information goes out, you decrease that anxiety because people know what to expect. Now you're just asking us to go, to go with, we don't know, you'll get them, trust us. I think that the, I mean, I think the point is that when that email went out, the response or another email or something should have gone out that just said, I mean, I, I think Darcy's point is, is absolutely correct. That it really is just a question about how the information is presented. Due to, <laughs> due to these pieces of... That's, that's twice, that's twice, that's <laughs> twice. Twice one night. Do, do, I mean, do, you know, you're, you're in this process that, anew in this district, and so you have to sort of take stock of what people have expected in the past and how things have been done in the past and whether they've been done well or not done well, you still have to be sensitive to that. And so this, this process of central office is taking over the scheduling process, which is what the email said and that, that may or may not have been, you know, for whatever the reasons for, for that actually appearing in an email aside, you know, there is just that question of what does that mean? And so when you look at what that means, it means that maybe parents are going to be, you know, upset about this because for some reason they think that you're looking through their students' folders. When in reality, what it is, is you're actually trying to do a better job by making sure that the staff members have common planning time, that there are those kinds of things worked out so that teachers can have the best experience that they have, and the, the, the parent and the, you know, the teacher feedback regarding student placement is still honored. And to say that is a lot better than to not say it. And so I think that moving forward, it's that kind of information that the board is looking for in response to, to these kinds of things that, that either come up or in preemption of these kinds of things so that we don't have to hear about them as missteps, right? But that we can think about the good things that are going on. The fact that you're going through this process right now with common planning time is by far the best thing that could be done for the teachers, by far, right? From an educational perspective. And if that means that student placement in classes has to be bumped back a month, so be it. Because at the end of the day, whether you get your kid's teacher at the end of June or the middle of July or the end of the Ju July, it doesn't matter, right? You're not gonna have your kid's teacher until you know, September. But to go through that process and have now this, this sense of common planning is now lost in some way, right? Because people are now viewing this as you know, some sort of machination of you know, administrative prerogative or something like that that you know, detracts from whatever, right? When it's not, it's a great teaching practice that you're putting in place that puts a little, you know, puts a damper on this, this notification. So I think the board, I will speak for the board when I say that these are the kinds of things that we, that we want you to be sensitive to moving forward, to be aware of moving forward, and to preempt these kinds of concerns moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Kim Hammond. I live at 255 Harrison Avenue. Um, Jason, thank you for reading out that email because I did want to also just quickly um, reference it. I have a sort of a different question. Um, I've actually been, as I like to point out, around the district for a while. So we've received those disappointing letters from time to time throughout the year when you think you're getting a class placement. And you don't and it, you know, you get over it. Um, uh, in fact, last year, uh, the kid leaving Irving, I have a second grader uh, here at Bartle, and she was in first grade leaving Irving, we got the letter because 
um, it's a large class and the class was growing. They had um, five first grade classes, and the, but they sent a letter out. It was very explicit and explained that we weren't getting a class placement because the class was growing from five classes to six classes and they had to add a teacher. So it was really, under, you know, you could really appreciate um, they needed to hire a teacher and they certainly couldn't make these placements. Anyway, it brought to mind when um, this came out though that um, the way I read your letter, Mr. Capone, was, or I'm sorry, I guess it was from Ms. Frazier, but that the class arrangements had been made. So I have, I think, a softball question, which is really just, um, do we know what our class sizes look like? Have the, you know, I'm wondering if there's been a change to class size. In other words, right now there's six second grade classes. I'm wondering whether those rising third graders, whether there's going to be six classes or five classes, whether that's part of, um, or, you know, those little groups that sounds like have been formed, they just haven't been assigned the teacher. So I'm just curious. Um, if there's been a change to overall class size and whether there'll be six classes for that rising third grade. Kim, I haven't even looked at it. I haven't even looked at it. We're not at so we're just, so this I can't I can't answer your question. I haven't looked at it. We're not at the point yet. So across the board, though, in general, is there, in other words, do we know if there's a type of change to class size? when you're talking about the last board meeting or when we did the budget at the board meeting, efficiencies and sort of that type of staff, you know, number of teachers per student. The efficiencies in the conversation we had about the schedules between Irving and Bartle was surrounding the specialists. Right. So, so in other words, I can assume that there's not a change to general class size. I, I don't that anticipate that you're going to see a, that any change in class size. But someone knows that there's been six third grade classes formed as opposed to five. I mean, that's something someone has done. That's very possible. You just don't happen to know. I, again, we were looking at the schedule. You're looking at overall staffing. OK, the number of issues that we've had in the district as far as certifications and making sure people are where they belong. Right. Okay. Well, it seems like that, you're that's looking an issue. at the and staffing so, and the schedule that you would sort of have to know also and how many special teachers that how many classes are there in the third grade or the like, you know, like well, but five it, of every grade versus six in every grade changes all those other things you're speaking. But, to. but it's more than that, because if you have people that have been in positions that they shouldn't have been because of certification reasons, and if you're looking to make sure that you maintain all staff and then you're looking at the bumping, okay, to make sure that the people that you have on staff go into those positions to make sure that they're filled. Um, that's, the, the, that's the first step. Um, and so when you're, you're talking about then what the schedules are going to be and how you utilize that staff to make sure that you retain everyone, um, you, you look, you're looking at certifications before you're looking at the names. Okay. Well, I would like to sort of add, I guess, that I feel the heart of a great school system is sort of small class size, and I hope that, you know, as that work's being done this summer, especially at Irving and Bartle, that, you know, that that's foremost. So, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Excuse me, I want to ask the students, um, do you guys have finals tomorrow? They might have them, I don't know. Let's hope not. No. I was just thinking you might want to go. <laughs> She's giving you an out. Take it. She's giving you an Take out. Take it. Well, Elena has her salutatorian speech due oh, by tonight. That's very important. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you should. Take the out. Thank you, girls. You're going to stay? You. Okay. Um, Andrew Zappa, 131 Johnson Street. Um, with regard to the limitation of time for the meetings overall, uh, I just want the board to just think of the historical perspective of limiting anything related to this process. Um, I think it should be evident why that should just never occur. We should just allow it to go as long as it needs. This meeting will probably end before 11. And those were emergency meetings that went late because you guys had a lot to discuss and we had a lot to discuss. And I think it's important that that just be allowed to occur. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, with regards to the scheduling, um, my biggest concern about that, because my sons are entering Bartle, is um, whenever you have an issue with scheduling, and I'm just going to think back to me 
I don't want anyone to think of kids as, and schools as being a manufacturing plan, but whenever you can't firm up a schedule, it's because there's some mathematical component that's missing, something that maybe hasn't been nailed down. I understand it could be staffing, it could be their certifications, and my only concern is that you're gonna try and find some way through efficiencies to reduce staff again. So I hope that's not the case. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Andrew. That is not the case, by the way. Judy Yang, 14 North 2nd. Um, as I listened to Ellen speak a little earlier on the process, um, more transparency in the process on how we look uh, to bring a principal on, um, just something quickly popped into my mind, so I just want to put it out there. Uh, even when applicants uh, apply to college, the admissions committee Google these kids and actually see. <laughs> So sometimes before you even bring the guys in, you can save a lot of man hours, you know, <laughs> let technology do a little work. That being said, I think sometimes the answers sometimes sit in front of us and we don't actually see sometimes a simple answer. And I get opportunities sometimes to talk to parents out there who I know have also said this to me. Currently, we have an interim principal over at the high school, Mr. Soto. And the suggestion that I've heard and I also would endorse is that they look to Mr. Soto taking the position, combining with his current position, if you're looking for some fiscal savings, because that's what you had mentioned before, so that he takes a small bump and you combine with his position. You take it on the chin a little bit. So I know some parents who've said that they would endorse that. Um, he's done a great job over there. I know other parents have really said, you know, they were skeptical of him in the beginning and they've like, they've won, they've won me over. That's what they've said to me. And so I just want to put that out there that he straightened out the school for a year or two and then you guys have longer time to find the right principal. Maybe the answer is right there in front of you. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Israel, what do you say? That's a nice compliment, Mr. Soto. Yeah. Mr. Soto, thank you for your excellent work at the high school. Thank you for the voters' confidence. I appreciate that. Thank you. Hello, I'm Heather Wilkerson, 247 Lincoln Avenue. Um, I'm here to follow Ellen and Judy um, to talk about the principal hire. I was actually on the high school principal hiring committee, and it was a great honor since I have so many kids coming through the high school. It's a really incredibly important decision, as all these uh, administrative and principal decisions are. Uh, Mr. Soto ran a terrific uh, committee meeting. Um, we had a, a couple good candidates, but I walked away feeling really uneasy about what we had just been through. I, I, I didn't feel like we had really gotten the information and been able to vet the candidates well enough within the process that, that you guys put forth. And I just have a couple of suggestions. I think that it's really important for us to know when we start the process to really have an idea of how many applicants applied for the job. Um, and be told what the criteria the initial selection committee is working with so that we understand why these particular candidates are put before us. Um, 
Of course, a half hour per applicant really is very little time to kind of vet through all the information in front of you, um, really kind of look through their credentials and go through the interview. Um, it was a lot of information to try to absorb and really form a, a solid opinion about this person. Um, the, inf the other piece of information that I think that would be really important at the beginning of the process is uh, some idea of what the overall process is. And that was not given to us right in the beginning. Um, I think we need to be told again the number of applicants, the criteria, and then the next steps after we vet the applicant, what's going to happen? Who's going to look at him? How long is it going to take to make a decision? Um, are we going to be called back and, and kind of be asked to give more feedback? Um, and that, that piece also, I think, is, is very important. I think that to have a hiring committee come in and sit for a day and review all this information and then just kind of go away is really ineffectual. I think that, that it needs to be, uh, if, if you're really looking for the input of that hiring committee, you really need to kind of let them sit on it and then revisit it and have at least a little bit of a dialogue about kind of what they thought when they went away, if they heard any new information, if they Googled them, for instance. Um, and I, I, I think that's it. I think that um, I think it's a great opportunity now that you guys have put this principal hire on, uh, taken it off the table. It's a great opportunity now. Um, to kind of look at the process and, and try to do it in a way that really inspires trust and confidence in the teachers and the parents. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, I'm Bobby Dave Kumar, Cedar Avenue. I just had a couple of real quick questions. I think just to follow up on some of the scheduling changes, there does seem to be, if you could just explain, I guess, what common planning is. I think a few meetings ago, there was a request, I think, by Darcy to get um, samples of what possible schedules would look like for Irving and for Bartle. And if there are any changes that you're thinking about, I know that with Ms. Krant leaving Irving, the district is down an ESL teacher, so when you talk about shared services within the districts, sort uh, within the schools within the district, sort of what do you mean? I mean, are there going to be shared services within ESL? Are there going to be groupings in a particular way? Is that part of some of the macro things that you're thinking about in terms of the time you need to get your scheduling in place? So I guess my question is, what's happening with ESL? What, if anything, is happening with specials? I know there was talk at one point with things about gym. And I guess what does the board know or what can be shared with the public about what some of these schedules would potentially look like for Irving and Bartle with some of the shared services? So, so the basic premise is that all of the specials for the grade level occur at the same time. And that allows all of those teachers to have the same time off for planning. So they would move through per grade level all of the specials through those two buildings. So like for example, how does gym work? Well, it, it's, it would be by grade level. So all second graders would have gym, would have art, would have music, would go to their specials at the same time. Okay, so does the time allotted to those classes change? Does the grouping within those classes change? So if, I'm, if my child goes to gym or art and he's in a class of 25, it's that class right now, his class goes to art. Mm -hmm. And so that's the class that would go within art, and the time allotted to those specials is not changing, is that correct? Correct. Okay, are there any changes to ELL? The, the ELL program, it was determined that uh, there was a more efficient way to do it, and so that's, uh, that's one of the things that is overlaid between the two buildings, as far as the usage of staff and the time that they see those students. Okay, so, so there will be, I guess, one teacher between the two, Bartle correct. and Irving? Okay, and then um, on another item, I guess it was item 22 on the finance committee on the yep. windows. So that's, so $720,000 was moved from the capital reserve to help fund this window project of which, you know, 
was um, funded by a grant, is that correct? Through our grant, yeah. Okay, so $432,000 were spent uh, to upgrade the Bartle windows, is that? No, no. I mean, 40% is coming from grant money, 60% of it. The is amount that is in the agenda is the local, the district share of the grant. The okay. state pays 40% of the total amount. This represents 60% of the total amount. And it, this is about $200,000 under budget. No, that's fine. I'm not asking right. whether it's over or under budget. I'm under, just asking under what the dollar what we is. Originally, sorry, hold on. Wait, I might be wrong. The, the contract came in under budget. Right. Uh, once the contract is com once the project is completed, then any remaining funds will return to capital reserve. How much is it costing the district to replace these windows? The district share is seven hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Okay. The state is paying another forty percent of the total. Right. Okay. And so that replaces all of the windows at Bartle. Is that correct? Was there? I'm just curious. I know that we're clearly in a budget um, situation here. Um, was there a particular need to replace all of those windows at once um, versus doing them in stages? It seems it's, it's a large number. I mean, the project is to replace all the windows other than the windows that were replaced in the later uh, 1996 referendum, which are newer windows. But all the windows are the same age. It's more efficient to replace all of them at one time. Okay. It's more cost efficient. And we have, we have the possibility of the Rod Grant at this point. Exactly. Right. And, so, and that was and what that was spurred us to even do this project. Right. Okay, but, but 720 is what the district is yeah. paying right now. That's absent the Rod Grant. And it's not out the door. No. Yes, that's correct. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Not yet. No, you misheard, you misheard what she said. She didn't say out the door. She oh, said out, out the door. door. Yeah, no, no. Oh, what did she say? She said, I don't know what she said, but whatever you said was correct. 720,000 is the district uh, share. Thank you. Thank you. She said absent Rod Grant. Oh, absent, absent the Rod Grant. I thought she said Afedora. Laney Rockman, 201 South 2nd Avenue. Who initially decides what people, I have to say this, you know, when people get up here to speak, it would really be respectful if everyone looks at them. Who decides what people from the initial application, from the initial applicants go to the final panel of teachers and parents. In other words, who, who took that pile of paper of applicants and decided which were the final applicants to go to that final panel? We do a district screening at the district office. We put them through, we bring Who's in- Who's we? Who's we? Well, the district administration. Okay, either myself or yes. Mr. Soto or Ms. Callis or a combination well, she's not, thereof. She, Ms. Callis and, is not here anymore. So you, Mr. Soto, anyone else? Ms. Callis. And from then, we send all of those applicants, all the ones that are screened, have gone onto the committee. Okay, so two people, basically is what you're saying, you and Mr. Soto, decide from a large pool of applicants who the final applicants will be who goes to that final panel, is that correct? There are three people who do it, Ms. Callis, Mr. Soto, and Mr. Capone. Okay, well, Ms. Callis isn't gonna be here Ms. anymore, so I assume through this next round that it will be you and Mr. Soto, is that correct? That's just a yes or no. We, we didn't, we didn't, yes. Thanks. Um, if it's at all possible, I would like to reiterate what Alan Leibowitz said before and have that initial, the initial decision made by a panel and not just Mr. Capone and not just Mr. Soto. I think that there are parents who should be a part of that. Uh, 
and to say that they can't be, I wonder what the reason would be. Is there a reason why you wouldn't have parents on that panel or teachers on that initial panel? No response? Is it possible to have we, them on we there? Have, we have followed the same process for all three principals. We did a screening at the district office. We sent on candidates to I the I didn't ask you that. You're not answering my question. And then the recommendation comes back to me. I know that. You didn't answer my question. My well, question is, is it, let me finish, let me finish. Is it possible to have parents and teachers also uh, making that initial decision about the applicants that go on to the final panel? Is it possible, anything yes or no? Is, anything is possible, Any. And some things are impossible. So are you saying it's possible that you might consider that? I, I'm do, you think, do you think that it's a reasonable consideration? We have a process by which we follow. I know you okay? do. That's the process. We're not looking to change the process. So you wouldn't consider having teachers or parents on that initial determination. Is that what you're saying, Adam? I'm, I'm saying I'm not looking to change the process, no. So that's what you're saying. So denying teachers or parents to sift through those initial applicants. Well, that's transparent. My next question is CPAC. Are you allowing CPAC parents to be on the committee to determine the special services director? The, the position is on the agenda tonight to be approved. She means for the, Just for interim. She means for the right one. For the interim. She means for the... Not for the interim. She means when we hire a director. For the permanent. Are CPAC parents going to be on the panel to decide who the permanent special services director will be. I, I don't see why we wouldn't include CPAC parents. Oh, because I understand that you said no, that they weren't going to be on that panel. So you're considering that they we should... We haven't scheduled, we haven't posted a position for a permanent director. When you we do, will you consider having CPAC parents on that panel to discuss the hiring of the new director? You know what I recommend? I think maybe we should have a committee to talk about the hiring process within the district at every single level. I think maybe that's the appropriate thing to do so we can get all these opinions about the personnel process and create a process for different levels. That's fine. Because the process hasn't changed in the last five years to my understanding. I don't appreciate your sarcasm. I'm not being sarcastic. We. I mean, meeting after meeting, right, get questions. questions about personnel, about this process, this that process, very, what it is. So if we want to have opinions, okay, then let's sit and have a committee and talk about what we expect for the town, for the community, for the hiring within this district. I don't think that that's, number one, not sarcastic. Number two, you seem to think that there's lots of people that would want to go through and screen resumes, that know what they're looking for, that would, would be interested in that as far as doing that, okay? I don't know that to be true. We followed the process that was established here. We've gone through it for each. All of the district office was done the same. Yep. Each one of the principals has been done the same. The teachers have been all done the same way. That's been the process. If you want to change the process, then let's have a committee to have a conversation Mr. about changing Capone, the process. Mr. Capone, you don't know that there are people available because you haven't asked. Because it hasn't been the process. It hasn't that's not, been the that's process. Never been, that's never been the protocol of this district, ever. Wait, uh, ever. I, I would like to Don't speak I would, to me that way. Yeah. I'm not speaking to you that way. I'm speaking I to I would every like to suggest, this is something that I've spoken with our New Jersey School Boards Association rep about a couple of times now. I would like for, I appreciate Tim's suggestion that we sit down and form some kind of committee about this. I would like to be on that committee. I would like to have Gwen come talk to us about other standard procedures in other districts. I don't see any problem with that. And I don't, I'm sorry, I don't agree that the process has been consistent every time. The first what's one, changed? the first, what's changed? Uh, apparently for the one at Irving, there was about 10 parents on it. They had to sign confidentiality agreements. We've seen all kinds of things that we've never seen before. So to sit here and say from the board table that every process has been the same is not correct in my opinion.
no, I'm just saying, I think what you mean is the process is the same as, because, I mean, even when, you know, not when I was a parent, I'm still a parent. Before I was on the board, the, you know, the main office, you know, they screen the resumes, exactly. they put together a committee, and somebody gets on the exactly. committee. That has not changed. Exactly. Thank you, Jerry. Anything else, Lainey? All I can say is the, uh, the defensive remarks are a very transparent response to a very reasonable request. Thank you. Thank you. Do Excuse I me, I just want to um, remind the public of our policy. Um, 0167, if you could please make sure you read number five, A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, well, when people go home, they can look it up. It's just a suggestion about the way that we phrase public comments. Ellen, please. Hi, Ellen Leibowitz again. I just, I just need to um, comment about uh, one of Mr. Capone's responses to, to uh, Ms. Rockman because it was, it was actually misleading. I was on the committee. We were told by the facilitator of the committee that Mr. Capone was the only one who read the resumes and that it was based on that screening that the six candidates, that those six candidates that he alone recommended brought forward. Now, is that the case or not? Because what you, the answer you gave was that it could be, you know, any one of the uh, central administrators. That's that's, correct. that's not what it we were be. told. Well, it your response, be. I'm sorry, with all due respect, your response was misleading. Ellen, I think we I were you, told you just... by Mr. Soto, who is yes. the facilitator of the committee, that Mr. Capone was the only one who screened the resumes. Right, and Mr. Capone, in answering the question, said that the central office staff. Right. It could have been Israel. It could have been Tim. It could have been Michelle. We but don't know. It wasn't. We're not. We're not talking about what the other two processes okay. were. Right. We're talking about this particular process. That's so to correct. say to say that that the answer was misleading generally, I don't think is fair. I'm just. Uh, perhaps it wasn't intentional, but I wanted to clarify and make sure that everybody knew mm -hmm. what what the committee members were told. Sure. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And, and I wasn't going to say this tonight, but I'm, I've decided to say it. I think that the searches that have happened in the recent past are a reflection of the leadership of the district. It's problematic, and we need to look at it. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Is there any other public comment? Okay. Um, Good evening, Rob Roslevich, one two three Magnolia Street. A uh, simple question for you. Last week, I think there was a question about whether or not gifted and talented in the programming for that. Any determination was made as to whether or not it's going to be a push-in or a pull-out sort of program. And uh, again, I, I haven't heard any discussion on it yet, so I was wondering if there's been a determination on that program for next year. It is going to be a pull-out portion for the project-based learning and the rest of the standards and the instruction is embedded within the classroom. Okay, based on that, uh, is there any potential for an extension for people to promote or encourage their children to be part of that program since now we sort of have some sort of idea of what it's going to look like and now parents might have a little bit more comfort level signing their children up for something that, you know, before this they had no idea what it would look like. If you want to submit for your child to be tested, Rob, go ahead. That, that's fine. The, the, the screening that they've done is the first step. We received a large number. They've gone through them. They're now going into the next round of screening. And th this is, uh, you know, in intended to be inclusive. So if you missed the deadline, go ahead and submit the paperwork. 
okay? As, as far as what the program looks like, as far as contact time, when we have 150 recommendations and there's currently uh, like 10 kids in the program, um, there, there's a pretty big gap from what has occurred to what is going to occur, and it's really going to depend on the numbers. Okay, and you think the recommendation earlier this year to let go one of your gifted and talented staff was uh, based on the idea that one person could handle 150 or more students with the... I didn't uh, say there was going to be 150 students in the program. I said there were 150 applicants. Okay. So based on the idea you had 10 before and you knew it would expand, and you, you thought it was a good idea to get run, rid of one of the staff from the gifted and talented program? Or are we going to be adding staff to that program later on? That was the appropriate decision in my mind. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, Jul I'm Julie Klimowitz. Mrs. K. And my address is the high school. <laughs> okay. I want to um, thank you again for your gracious speech and kind words. That was nice. I have my red shirt on. It's supposed to show we're all together. Um, I appreciate your decision to um, delete the first number one thing. Um, I want to believe that everyone has learned something from this process. Um, the word transparency came up again tonight, and um, I was in a position where someone had lost their job and I was happened to be on a trip with them. And it was mortifying to me, it was embarrassing to me, that the person found out they were not rehired from reading the board minutes. I hope you understand what that means. That means that someone was told in writing they did not get the job, but they were not told in person. And I've been in Highland Park for a long time. And years ago, if you did not get a job, the board, the principal, whoever was in charge, had the decency to talk to the person, maybe in March, and say, you know what? Things don't look good. Start to look now. We don't have to tell you till April unless we see things that are happening. And there have to be people in place that if you don't like what someone is doing or you don't care for how they do something in the classroom, that you have someone at the top in that building to be able to teach them how to improve. Um, I came into this school many years ago when I was in trouble all the time. Um, but you didn't get yelled at in front of anybody. You were backed up and then you went into the back room and then you were blasted why you did something the way, or the way I did it. But it made me a better person and I learned a lot from it. Because the person who was teaching me had a human side to them. And that human side used to be in Highland Park. And something is, just there's a disconnect someplace. So I would hope, I'm not gonna be here, but I hope you get it back. Because this is really a great place to be, and it's a special town, and a lot of people who come in don't realize that when we say Highland Park, it's Highland Park, it really is Highland Park. I don't live here, I've been here like I've lived here, but it really is unique, and you have a lot of wonderful qualities. Don't lose them with not doing the next thing I'm gonna talk about. The next thing I wanna talk about is logic. If you could do things in a logical order, ask questions. Ask the peon that's in the classroom, how does something work? Or if you have someone that's a top who's gone through all the steps, has been a teacher, a master teacher, and now has become maybe the department chairperson if we had them. And then you go to be a vice principal and a principal and you're knowledgeable in all those things. That's the kind of person you want to run your school so you can rely on them and they know what the experience is like to have been in the classroom. So they can speak for both the student and the teacher and be a backup. And I know every, you know, I know most of you up here anyway, but to be educated in education is really important. So maybe on this committee could be someone that knows about grounds and construction. And somebody else on this committee is a business person that knows how to do the money and the books. And then you come together, because I like what you talked about, about coming together and asking questions, and it was brought up by somebody, that the next part of my thing was the reasoning skill. That, and I teach this in class, what is a reasoning skill? The next step that makes logic of what you just did so it all flows in a progression and it works well. 
So the reasoning cell was the next step. What could I do? If you have a problem, ask somebody. Ask a question. How do you think this would work? Because Highland Park was never like this. You got together, you had a committee. Someone brought up about the um, interview committee. I was on those interview committees. We sat down and we sat for hours and read every damn resume that went through over that desk. And we talked about everybody and we had verbal stuff going on and it went over a couple days or we met after school whenever it was we did it so we really felt comfortable with the person that we wanted at the top my next problem is nepotism it's important to hire someone because of their expertise not because someone knows them <laughs> I if I bring someone to the table, it's because I'm going to give them a recommendation that they're good. I don't expect someone to come to, the, to bring someone I'm going to be embarrassed by because they don't know what they're doing. And I think that's really important. Um, I talked about the transparency already, about someone finding out, reading about themselves in the minutes that they did not get hired or did not get a job. I hope you'll revisit that because it's really not a very, I say, classy way of doing things, but the human side would be nice to come out. Um, what else? Someone brought up Mr. Soto being the principal. He does a great job, but he wears many hats. Does he really want to do this job? <laughs> really? Okay? But we have to ask him. So, really, you know, he's the head of operations, he's supposed to watch over the grounds, he's supposed to mentor a new principal, and he's supposed to stand outside and greet the students and watch what they're wearing when they come into school. Really, let's get uniforms because khaki pants and a red shirt or black and red, nobody would have to worry about anybody's chest coming out of their shirt, their stomach sticking out, the shorts up their butt, and what the boys are wearing. The boys are out there too. Boys look pretty bad too with the big, you know, big open sides. They're not supposed to wear straps, so I think everybody should wear t-shirts, but I won't be here to comment on that next year anyway. All right? I like something that was said about being clear. Um, I teach this and I talk about this to my students and myself and my own family. Um, if you make a mistake, apologize. The word apologize, it's okay to say, I screwed up. All right? We made a mistake, let's move on. The process is called owning it. Own up. Own it. I screwed up. I did it. I wish I didn't. How can I move on? And we make it clear that we're trying to help ourselves. So we all work together. Um, and if you do that, you find that after you make that blunder, I don't expect it repeated again, but at least you tried and you accept that you made a mistake. Look yourself in the mirror. We are not perfect. And the sooner you find the problems you have, you're 50% past the battle of what you can do to do better. Um, and let's see. I agree that it's good to discuss. Oh my God, I wrote so many notes. All right. Uh, and then a couple suggestions for, for me outside. Maybe you could get the um, grounds people to maybe hire somebody else so that everything could be taken care of and the same people aren't running around killing themselves all hours of the day trying to make all the buildings look nice or the grass get cut. I don't know how that works. You can handle that. <laughs> oh, uh, my one comment about the gym. The gym is so hot. So last year or the year before, we spent thousands of dollars on a system that blows hot air around when it's hot out and blows cold air around when it's cold out. So it's not a cooling system, and when you're in a sport and you're sweating, if it's cold out, you're cold. If it's hot out, you're hot. It hasn't made much of an improvement. But about 12 years ago, I sat with Stephen Nolan, who was my student, who was here and was a mayor, and we talked about just throwing a ventilating ceiling fan in the side of the wall and let it suck the air out. So it's really not a bad idea. If your kids play sports, they can tell you. All right? And now, it was nice to hear nice things about me. It would be nice to see everybody agree, come to some kind of conclusion so that we can leave school this year, not that I'm getting a contract, but that you can leave school knowing that everything's ratified and everything is good and start on the right foot and a happy high note come September. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Is there any other public comment?
Claire, could we have um, the curriculum motions, please? Uh, yes, hold on. Let me, let me get back to it. I would like I would like to move items one through nine on the agenda for curriculum. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion about the curriculum items? Okay, Linda, could we have a roll call, please? Ms. Aversa? Yes. Ms. Berkowitz? Yes. Ms. Bull? Ms. Simarusti? Yes. Mr. Ross? Yes. Ms. Sherber? Yes. Mr. Sherman? I'm sorry. Oh, that's right, he left him, sorry. Mr. Warden? Yes. Catherine, can we have the finance items moved, please? I'd like to uh, move items 1 through 33, 32, and 30, I'm sorry, 1 through 31, and, one, and the other two on the finance, on the addendum. Second. Is there any discussion of those items? Ms. Aversa? Yes. Ms. Berkowitz? Yes. Ms. Bull? Yes. Ms. Simarusti? Yes. Mr. Ross? Yes. Ms. Sherber? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. Uh, Ann? I would like to move items 2 through 14 on the regular agenda with the corrections to number 4 that I read in before, and uh, items 15 and 16 on the addendum. Is there any, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion of those items? Ms. Aversa? Yes. Ms. Berkowitz? Yes. Ms. Bull? Yes. Ms. Simarusti? Um, I'm going to abstain on two through six until we have further discussion about the hiring process, and yes on the rest. Mr. Ross? Yes. Ms. Sherber? Yes. Mr. Wharton? Yes. Um, Anne, can you move the policy items, please? Or item? Yes. Uh, give me a minute. It's just, just, one. just one. Okay, I'd like to move item one. Second. Second. Is there any discussion of any of the policies? Ms. Aversa? Yes. Ms. Berkowitz? Yes. Ms. Bull? Yes. Ms. Simarusti? Yes. Mr. Ross? Yes. Ms. Sherber? Yes. Mr. Warden? Yes. For the President's report, I just want to start by just, uh, again, congratulating the Teachers of the Year and um, the retirees. Ms. Kay and Ms. Potabeki were teachers of mine when I was in school here, and uh, Ms. Radke has done an amazing job of teaching my son the finer points of Vivaldi. So uh, I look forward to their continued growth throughout the school. And to the student reps, again, thank you again so much for your service and good luck in your future. The only other thing that I want to discuss is just the events that we have coming up. We have a number of really uh, excellent events that I hope the public will be uh, coming out for. Our moving up or graduation events, we have the high school graduation, which is June 23rd at 6 p.m. on the front lawn of the high school. The eighth grade moving up is June 23rd at 11 o'clock in the middle school gym. Bartle moving up is June 23rd at 9.15 in the Bartle School Gym. And the Irving First Grade Show is uh, Friday, June 20th at 10 a.m. in the Irving Gym. The award ceremonies that we still have remaining this year, we have the Eighth Grade Awards, which is June, 9th, uh, June 19th rather, at 11 a.m. in the High School Auditorium. And the Bartle Awards Ceremony, which is June 20th at 9 a.m. in the Bartle Gym. We have a technology committee meeting coming up. Uh, we had our first one on June 11th, which was um, pretty small but we're hoping that we can have a better turnout Thursday, June 26th at 6.30 p.m. in the middle school cafeteria. And that's it for the President's report. I just want to share that uh, Claire and I were at the Senior Awards along with Tim and, and Israel, and it was, it was really just, it's wonderful to, you know, to see how, how much is being achieved in the high school. It's, it's, it's a great night. And, and I was at the student, uh, student of the Year banquet with Jerry, who was there as a, the mother of an honoree, and, um, and Catherine. And it's, in, in, we don't do it in Piscataway. We don't do something like this. But to have everybody there with their families who had been, you know, the 9th through 12th Student of the Year in each of the months 
and then come out and have that celebration, just phenomenal. And um, Michelle Marr, who put the event together, did a really wonderful job. The, each of the presenters that were there read the, the sort of the bios, the recommendations from the teachers about each of the students who had won each month from each of the grade levels. So they were celebrated again, and then a student of the year was selected. And um, it, the, the jazz band played, and it was a very, very positive event, which I was very, very ple pleased to be a part of. I was at, also at the NHS, and they, you know, they had the band there. Ms. Doozy did a phenomenal job putting that together as well. So it is, it's just, it's a special time of year, and at least we, you know, we just get to recognize so many of our students and accomplishments in the high school. It's really great. Yeah, definitely. Um, is there any old business? Uh, I'd just like to update everybody quickly. Um, today, the full assembly um, uh, approved uh, a three zero. A3081, sorry, it's getting late, um, which is great. Uh, it's going to be heard by the Senate um, Education Committee this Thursday. I'm hoping I can go and deliver the same testimony that I delivered before the Assembly Education Committee. Um, frankly, I'm kind of shocked that it's being considered by the Senate, but it is, so I'm glad and hopeful, and I'll keep everybody updated. And um, the other thing I want to let you know is I've, I have seen multiple other resolutions now coming out of other districts, which is um, really exciting. And I've connected with the president of the Washington Township Board of Education, who has passed a similar resolution, and she and I are going to get together and try to get the resolution um, to as many other districts as we can. So we're hopeful that that will continue to put additional pressure on the Senate right now. Yeah. And, and I, again, I just want to thank Ashley and Darcy for, uh, for helping me the three of us got together and, and wrote that and it is it's it's fantastic to see the resolution making the rounds and the more press and the more interest that it gets it really is um, you know it's a, it's clearly a testament to the, the the way that it was written the contributions of everybody and I look forward to seeing the impact that it's going to have for this bill and of course contact your local representatives ours are um, is Barnes Senator a co-sponsor? Uh, no. I don't believe that there are any Senate co-sponsors yet, or at least I haven't seen them. They may have started with co-sponsors, but I haven't seen that. Um, okay. But um, Dignan, I believe, is one of the co-sponsors in the Assembly. Um, Assemblyman Dignan and Nancy Pinkton were great hands with them, and I believe with uh, Senator Barnes as well. And just in case anybody's here who doesn't um, recall what the legislation is, it's to create a task force to take a look at uh, both Common Core and Park and would put a two-year implementation delay on any um, stakes attached to the testing and so not much. the testing itself not the testing itself yes the testing would still commence um, but there would be no stakes attached and um, one of the more fascinating developments I think in the last couple of weeks is that um, the Gates Foundation has come out and said that they support the idea of no stakes being attached to the test for two years which is a little bit like Frankenstein saying hmm. they don't like their monster anymore but um, I was, I was interested to see that. That is very interesting. Is there other old business? Is there any new business? Um, I have a question. So, because I want to introduce this um, for a first reading, but I don't know how long it will take. And um, judging by the time and that I have to leave at 11, I don't know if there's enough time to even do it. So can somebody tell me what the process is? The process, I believe, is that you you are going to, I mean, you would create a motion. If the motion gets a second, then we would vote to add the policy for a first reading for the next meeting. Okay, so then we don't is that, read is it. Is that correct? We don't read it and discuss it tonight? I'm just trying the to judge The board doesn't usually time. read through, uh, you know, without having a chance to have reviewed it before. I would, I would think that it would be appropriate uh, for you to um, send out or distribute to the board so that they can uh, take a look at it. It has been reviewed by the policy committee, though, mm -hmm. and, who didn't choose to bring it forward. And I suppose at this point, it, the full board could decide whether to bring it forward. But they should have some time to review it uh, ahead of time, to, to read something in a meeting or, or to um, here you dictated in a meeting. I don't believe that that's effective. So, uh, Mr. Ross, it's, it's your decision if you would recommend that she, um, you know, just present it for their review, and then um, she can suggest that it be brought forward for first reading. But 
I think what I'd like to do is pass it out so everybody can look at it and at the yeah. next meeting bring it up. I would suggest maybe bringing it up under old business in the next meeting and then mm -hmm. the board can decide whether to bring it forward for a first, uh, first review during that meeting. Okay. okay. Sounds okay. good. So can I pass it out now? Sure. sure. Okay. It's the same one that you gave us last time? No. It's changed from last time? It is changed, yes. It's typed. Okay. I have it. So. Uh, was so the you same. don't want to use the last no, one? That's, you want to use that's, why I, I that's why I was asking, because if it was, then I didn't need it, because I still have it. No, it's typed. Okay. Is there enough? There's more. I think there's enough. Can we get one sent to bread? Do you have a, oh, a, a paper copy? Do you have it on um, electronic? Like? Yeah, I can send it to him. Yeah, send it to Greg and send it to Adam. Adam, Adam had to go. Oh, okay. okay, is there any other new business? Highland Park Board of Education welcomes public participation and has reserved this time for your comments. Please, if you're interested in making public comment, go up to the podium, state your name, address, and remember that we are still uh, operating on a three minute time frame. Hi, Ann Gowan, uh, South 2nd Avenue. Uh, I think enough negative stuff has already been said, some of which I agree with, some of which I don't. But I wanted to uh, thank the board for uh, voting to renew Mrs. Couch's um, uh, contract, and we're all very excited about that at Irving, so thank you very much. And I, I just want to, feedback from parents has been great about the principal there, about Mrs. Weishes, Ms. Wyshezenski. Um, so thank you, I think that was a fantastic hiring choice, and we're just hearing lots of good things. Great. So thank you. Thank you, Ann. Is there any other public comment? Niece May Fryer, 314 Wayne Street. Uh, I spoke before, I reiterate that I think the board should not pass Ms. Berkowitz's suggested policy. I do not think you should end things at 11 o'clock because it's time to go home and I don't think that you should, as a matter of course, limit public speech to three minutes because sometimes you might need more than that. Sometimes you might need less. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I need a resolution to go into executive session at 6.30 p.m. on July 21st, 2014 at the Bartle School to discuss personnel, litigation, and negotiations. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Need a motion to adjourn? So moved. If I can Second. just add one thing. Um, I know he just oh. left, but if, I just wanted to thank Mr. Gold for guiding both Elena and I throughout this whole process oh. because it's been difficult sometimes. So, oh, you should yeah. have interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> and you walked in, but it's okay. <laughs> thank you, Anna. Um, so we need a motion to adjourn. Motion was, was Darcy and second. I'm sorry. Motion was Darcy for adjournment. Thank you. Second is? Me, second. Okay, all in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you.